You're listening to Aviation Marketing Hangar Flying, the community for the best sales and marketing professionals in the aviation industry. You can't learn to fly just from a book. You learn from other pilots who know the tools, the skills, and the territory. Your hosts, John and Paula Williams, are your sales and marketing test pilots. They take the risks for you and share strategies, relevant examples, hacks, and how-tos. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes so you won't miss a thing. All right. Well, welcome to uh, today's book club discussion uh, about the new rules of marketing and PR by David Meerman Scott. This is one of my very favorite books. This is one of the first books I picked up when I was getting out of the corporate marketing world and into uh, marketing for aviation and it had a huge impact on on me and on our company on ABCI so um, I'm really looking forward to uh, sharing it with um, with everyone and, and talking about it so this is this is good stuff mm -hmm. so first impressions about the book what did you think Catherine well I I thought it was very good um, it the the title caught my interest because we've had new rules unfolding since the introduction of the World Wide Web, and it's, uh, it was interesting to me that somebody could just put it all together in a book, and uh, um, I think we all need to be really, really cognizant of what what is available to, you, to use to increase sales because that's the ultimate goal. And this, this book does a, a really good, uh, good job of that. Absolutely. John, what did you think? Well, having worked with you since the inception of the company, uh, <laughs> you're a little biased also. You, well, you told me that this has been your Bible since forever and reading the book, uh, with rare exceptions, you follow it right along. So there's, <laughs> I mean, I'm used to it. <laughs> okay, it seems like home, huh? Uh -huh. Excellent, yeah, me too. And um, I forgot to do inter introductions. You'll have to forgive me, I got so excited. We jumped right into the book. But uh, I'm Paula Williams and Catherine, you're also with us? Yes, uh, Catherine Creedy, Communication Strategies. I uh, am a freelance aviation journalist and public relations consultant. Fabulous. And I write blogs. Yep, <laughs> absolutely. And John? John Williams. I uh, work for Paula, <laughs> ABCI. <laughs> Fantastic. That makes me happy. So I'm glad that uh, that works out. So what did you think of the concept of the book? Um, now this kind of threw me to start with. I thought, you know, this is not very professional, but um, it's uh, actually it works really well. And, you know, the way that uh, that David Meerman Scott explains it in the introduction, basically what he has done is taken his blog posts for a year or more. Um, it's actually been growing. When I first picked it up, this book was half its size. And now it's in the neighborhood of um, 420, 442 pages before the index. And uh, we actually had to use special packaging to send this out to our book club because it wouldn't fit in our usual uh, book club um, mm -hmm. envelopes. <laughs> but we mm -hmm. made an exception for this one. So um, what did you think, Catherine? Um, I actually thought it was very useful. I'm not a big one for flashiness because uh -huh. I, you know, sometimes it's all flash and no content, but I found that this was really, um, it's obviously um, self-published, but I love the way he repurposed what he was already doing into a really good how-to manual to increase your sales. So um, I, I was not put off by the non-flashiness of it because I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I think I go beyond that Right. as a matter of course. Absolutely. John, what did you think? Well, to me, since I've been working with you, it just seemed like a rehash. <laughs> so it just sounded like you talking all over again. Right. Okay. But um, <laughs> on one hand, this is somebody who, um, you know, publishes this stuff for free on the web. 
And then we go and spend, um, well, the retail price for this book is, uh, geez, I don't even know. It's on here somewhere. Um, go and spend money on books. You know, 24 bucks. 24 bucks um, yeah. on a big brick of paper to send to our uh, our book club. And, you know, the fir first time I ran across this book, I thought, well, why on earth am I going to buy this book? And then I'm going to read his blog and I'm going to see the comments and everything anyway and all of that stuff. But when it comes down to it, I would much rather have a book in my hands. And it's turned out to be much more useful because of the way he's organized it. And because of the fact that, you know, some of these things are blog articles, he's included some of the more useful comments and things that happened um, as a result of the blog into the book. So I'm glad I'm recording. Yeah, I, I really like that, too. And the reason and, and it really good, gives good insight, especially, you know, coming from both of us, PR and and. Uh, um and journalism i love the fact that you uh, in that bit on the end of how to use your uh press releases to market direct to consumers um he gave a little debate on on what was wrong with that and i thought well the guy who was debating him is definitely wrong he's right <laughs> so that insight was uh that insight was very valuable to me right I'm glad I'm recording this because she <laughs> said she'd rather have a book in hand and she doesn't, she's the social media here, online only kind of person. So true. Book. Huh? Yeah. I mean, I like having things on my Kindle, but in this case, um, I really like having the book in my hands because, uh, you know, if you could see my copy and especially if you could see my old copy of episode one or the, the first edition of this, it is so dog-eared and bookmarked and sticky notes hanging out of it and, you know, there's so much in it that uh, it, it turned out to be a really useful book, I think. Um, yeah. Um, one other thing that I didn't mention is we've actually had, you know, we repurpose content for ourselves and for our clients. And, uh, you know, so, for example, this particular episode is going to be a blog post and a podcast, and it may end up in a book uh, of ours in the future. And we use uh, materials for clients when we write uh, articles, pub, uh, press releases, and so on for them. Being able to reuse those multiple times really makes it a lot more, gives them a lot better bang for their buck and makes it a whole lot more worth doing. Um, you know, just our podcast. Yeah, it's also, you know, for, for him, it, it goes to the cardinal rule of marketing where you provide free content to make the contact and from which you will you know that's the that's the funnel strategy and then you can market to them or you can sell to them or whatever yeah uh, but um that's exactly what he did by giving his his best advice in his blog and then repurposing it it into a book or a podcast or whatever is always very important exactly exactly so, um, yeah, and, you know, our podcast actually has gotten almost 10,000 downloads, and that kind of started as an afterthought of our blog. Uh, you know, we thought, well, maybe mm -hmm. people would rather listen than read uh, or mm -hmm. you know, watch videos than read. So, you know, if we do that in multiple formats, uh, it's really interesting to see how that ends up being consumed in different ways. So. Yeah, so, so clearly you're reaching new audiences with that. Right, right. Yeah, that's true. And the um, so book reviews end up being some of our most popular podcast episodes. So that's that's fun because we end up getting the uh, um, the author's entire entourage, while, you know, wanting to hear what we said about the book. So that's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, let's talk about the long tail of marketing, um, and this is from page thirty-two, and. Mm -hmm. What we mean by that is, you know, it kind of used to be that you would run a Super Bowl ad or a one page, big, splashy ad campaign, and it would be one big thing that happened. And, you know, you would basically coast on that forever. <laughs> you know, that would be your big, splashy debut, you know, but in the, the digital economy, it has turned more into a, a platform or a digital um, or a drip model. And, uh, you know, we talk about long term in terms of or long tail in terms of SEO. Those are long keywords that very few people are looking for. 
but the people that are looking for them are very interested in your product or service. And it's the same thing with marketing. You have very specific, very small advertising happening throughout the year. And that's a whole lot more cost effective. And it's also more likely to reach a more specific audience, which works great for aviation, right? It seems to me if you do it correct, right. you get the inverse of that graph. <laughs> you do. That is um, mm -hmm. potentially. Seriously. Great. I mean, you start with very small and it builds up mm -hmm. forever. True. With you do it right. And it, it, once again, it expands the audience. Uh, because these people are highly receptive when they want the information, and isn't that the key to marketing? Is right. hitting people when they are when they're interested, so the take rate is higher, and yeah. the and the sales, you know, the the the, the sales term uh, shortens quite a bit. In other words, the time that it takes to sell that person shortens because they already have a heightened interest. Exactly. Because you're catching them when they're interested in buying and not when you're interested in <laughs> in the Super Bowl it. or yeah, whatever it is that you're building your advertising around. But but going back to your Super Bowl uh, yeah. analogy, um, you may coast on it or you may not. <laughs> True. So to put all your marketing eggs in one basket for a big splash when you could be far more strategic with it, it is a huge debate and it I think it comes down on being far more strategic than than just doing a big a big class so to say, well I've got a Super Bowl ad coming up and getting ink from the Super Bowl ad. That's okay. not I, to me that's not the way to sell a product. Yeah. It may be the way to sell a retail product, but I don't even know that anymore. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a, the economy has changed so much and um, aviation is so different from retail that I think this model works a whole lot better uh, in our market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, one example that comes to mind and I'm trying to um, remember exactly what he said, but Damon John um, from Shark Tank, I'm not really a big, <clears throat> hip hop fan. <laughs> I can't imagine why, but um, I'm really impressed with Damon John be just because he started from nothing and um, has really built a lot of successful businesses from very tiny niches, you know, very specific uh, groups of people. And so, you know, when someone's on Shark Tank and they're talking about market size, he says he just completely nods off when they talk about market size because he doesn't care you know, unless you're advertising for left-handed pot-bellied pigs with astigmatism, um, you know, there is a big enough market for just about anything. It's just a matter of how engaged are you with that market and how engaged is that market with you? Um, you know, mm -hmm. so anything, if you've got a hundred people who are raving fans, that's enough to build a business and then expand from there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So and it goes back to the long tail of marketing and, and putting it out just at the right time and being very, very strategic in what you put out, where you put it. Right. So if you're trying to engage everybody on the planet, you know, that short tail works. But, you know, if you're trying to engage a very specific group of people, it takes time to find them all and collect them into a little tribe and and turn that into something that's that's useful. Right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, he's got a good idea on one hand, but uh, I think he's looking at a larger picture rather than a smaller market. Yeah. Well, smaller market. It depends on what you're selling because mm -hmm. not everybody's going to care about a new Tesla, but the people <laughs> that do will be different from those that all they want is a car. Yeah, convenience and that uh, and economy. So. True. It depends on what they're looking for. Absolutely. And the difference in market size is extreme for those that want to spend a hundred grand for a Tesla versus somebody that's only got fourteen thousand dollars to spend on a car. Right. Exactly. And uh, so, you know, if you're selling Teslas, you got to go for the big. Mm -hmm. You got. You have got to figure out what your market size is. Mm -hmm. Where he says you didn't care. Well, I'm sure Elon Musk does. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the same in aviation. I mean, uh, what's the market size for a 380, for instance? 
terribly it, minuscule compared to the 737. Exactly. And we had a, a client at one time who sold a very specific financial service for a very specific model of aircraft. And we figured out that she had a total universe of 67 possible clients. Um, but wow, did well, you know, um, with that audience. So, you know, not everybody's going to hear about that business and not everybody should hear about that business because it only mm -hmm. applies to 67 humans on earth, you know. So that's really the extreme, I think, and aviation is the extreme of the extreme in there. So, mm -hmm. all right. So let's talk about thinking like a publisher. Um, I like this this thought, and this is probably the key motivation for constructing ABCI the way we did, as opposed to the way um, every other marketing company I've seen is is constructed. Constructed. Well, is the uh, model <laughs> built? Built. <laughs> the model is almost like a um, a magazine. You know, we look for topics that our customers are likely to be interested in, and that's how we attract customers is by publishing material, right? Uh -huh. And it works really well for us, and it's worked really well for um, a great number of of our clients. You know, charter companies that talk about the the destinations that are near them. Um, you know, uh, legal companies that talk about the problems that their customers may be having uh, at the time and space that they're in the market for their services. Uh, FBOs that talk about their area and talk about, uh, you know, what pilots want to hear about in that part of the world. Um, you know, the uh, interior design for aviation is a whole different market. <laughs> <laughs> that we, you know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, interior designers are a whole different set of people. They got a whole different vocabulary, and then aviation interior. Oh, they do, they do. Yeah, and they have an entirely different mission and and vision. I was, I just did a story um, on Embraer's um, Embraer Executive Jet's interior strategy, and the concept it's come up with. I mean, they haven't got any customers yet, but if that customer walks through the door, who wants? A, a yacht like experience in their aircraft or who wants a, uh, to look like make it look like our art deco or who wants floor to ceiling win, win, uh, windows in their aircraft. I mean, Embraer is ready. That's fantastic. That's really a neat, uh, neat way of looking at it. You want a yacht like experience in your aircraft. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was talking to their their interior designer, or rather their their chief designer, the vice president of um, customer design, and uh, he was his vision is just incredible. And I the story I did was where do you get your inspiration? And the inspiration was not from other aircraft; it was from high end products and why pe analyzing why people buy those products and what makes them worth hundreds of dollars or millions of dollars, um, and how do you translate that experience of that product, whether it's a purse or a shoe or, or a yacht or whatever, into an airplane. So for the oil barons, they have a cowboy or a western theme. For Hollywood barons, they've got uh, Hollywood moguls. They've got um, something that looks like uh, Hollywood from the 1930s, and for the Japanese, they have floor-to-ceiling windows because they know Japanese like to dine on the floor. So uh, it's it's really fascinating. But when you get out of that box of just trying to fill a, a human mailing tube, then you really get to get can get creative. So it's a different way of thinking. Uh, and it's a way that aviation has to adopt because we, I think, you know, we're all um, distracted by so many things around us that when we can take a concept that's super professional, uh, super successful and, and say, try to apply it somewhere in aviation, then you become a disruptor or you become a, um, you, you start thinking out of the box and people you'll get at least ink out of it. I've seen so many stories on this. After I finished mine, I saw several more that were that, that came at the same time. Uh, well, that and you're a trendsetter, Catherine. So <laughs> everybody's welcome. <What? laughs> 
<laughs> Imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but uh, we talked about yeah. that last week. Yeah. <laughs> Marketing Monday. My competitor does everything that I do. That's hysterical. Mm -hmm. All right. So I really liked this example, the not another junkie blog um, for 1-800-GOT-JUNK. Did you see that one? Um. Oh, wait a minute. I think I skipped that one. What page is oh. on that? Oh, geez. Let me see. Do, 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 do. Oh, wait a minute. 95? 95. Yeah. 95. Yeah. 95. Yeah. So. Um, I love that. I love that whole concept because it's so multitasking. Yeah. Uh, you write a blog and your franchisees get ideas on how they can market in their own hometown and uh, it explains what the company is all about and how it works and it hits and and of course my favorite part was they're using the calendar yeah so you know new year's is resolution time let's get organized and uh how to make more room for when the in-laws come to visit and i i really like that because uh it it was for many, it, it, it could be used for so many purposes, but it also struck a chord so that when somebody wants to get organized, there it is on the internet, how to do it. Absolutely. So, and it also changes the position of these folks from garbage men <laughs> to people who are helpful. And there are so many people um, that I talk to all the time that um, say, well, my business is boring. There's nothing to write about in insurance or you know whatever the situation is uh, but if you take this example and you know you say well how could you possibly write a blog about trash removal and these guys do a fantastic job of coming up with really good ideas that are timely and uh, interesting and fun and um, you know that people actually read well one of the things that makes it so important the, the way she does it is uh, because she's not selling anything. What she's doing is providing hints. Yeah. Saying to the customer, gee, you could do this on your own. Yeah. If you wanted to do this on your own, here's ABC of garage sale or however you want to eBay or however you want to do it. Um, but if you don't want to do it on your own, here's, here's some other ideas. Right. Um, so it's providing free information. It's news you can use. Um, but without the heavy sales pitch, it's explaining an industry that you know most people don't know anything about. Right. And uh, so, and and it's free. It's like free information. Hey, I'm I'm doing this as a favor to you. Right. And hopefully, you'll think of us when it's time to get rid of all your junk. Well, and I kind of beg to differ with the the point that she's not selling anything. She is absolutely selling something very, very masterfully. And if you look at the results that they've gotten uh, in terms of sales and everything else, um, you know, it doesn't look like she is selling something, but she absolutely positively is. You know that is the motivation behind this, and you know that is why she gets the resources she does, you know, to do this uh to do this blog is because it is successful and it's absolutely helping their sales numbers. You're you're absolutely right, Paul. But a, as a reader, yeah, there's no hard sales pitch in there, and and, and that's what I was thinking of. As a reader, it's gee, she's just trying to help me, and yeah. uh, maybe I'll go to the website or whatever to see what other blog what what blogs are saying. So yeah, there's she's definitely trying to sell something. But as a reader, you don't feel as if it's a, a late night infomercial. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Well, everybody is always trying to sell something. I think that's mm -hmm. probably true. It's uh, cynical, but it's it's not cynical, actually. I mean, no, I mean selling... it doesn't matter whether you're selling yourself or selling your idea. Yep. You may not gain traction financially, but when you talk to somebody else and try to convince them of your way of thinking, that's selling. Absolutely. I mean, I use. But it's also a warmer relationship. It's, yeah. In other words, it's, it, gee, this is a pal of mine trying to help me out, with, yeah. you know, even though I don't know them. So it's a warmer relationship than just saying, you know, call, it's just a television commercial that says, call 1 800 got dunk. Got um, dunk. Yeah. And, uh, 
so I think it's it's a different puts a, the relationship, and of course everything is about relationships. So it puts this on a different plane than just retailing. Yes, that is absolutely true, and uh, I totally agree with that. I was just going to say I use sales techniques when I'm trying to get John to go have Indian food. You know, it's not his his favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> we're always, uh, you know, using sales techniques on each other, whether we, uh, you know, whether we like it or not, right? Nice. Well, what I want to know is, do you guys know that you're using sales techniques? Do you recognize it and go, oh, nice try, but it's not going to work this time? <laughs> you know what? I actually kind of enjoy it. You know, when somebody is really a good salesperson um, and, you know, is also personable and, and easy to get along with. It's just like we almost jump into that and say, that was really well done. Can you tell me how you did that? <laughs> yeah, we don't want to buy what you're selling, but tell me about your approach. Exactly. No, it's, <laughs> we're such nerds. It's, uh, it's hard to, to relate to real humans. But um, OK, so um, content being the focus of successful full websites. I think people get so hung up on design and color and sliders and moving things and, and you know cool technology and stuff like that. But I really think that um, I agree with, with, with Scott that um, great content is really the differentiator because I think a nice design nowadays is expected and uh, having a nice design is just the starting place for, for any kind of commerce. Mm -hmm. That's your, your introduction. It's your first impression. Yeah. That's why they find you, you know, and, uh, you know, your, your design might get them for seven seconds, but then if the content doesn't keep them, then that's a complete waste of, of everybody's time. Well, mm -hmm. the content is mm -hmm. easily discernible. Yeah. yeah. That gets you the next long enough to, oh, okay, let's see what it's got to say. Yeah, and then it has to be grabby and sticky and right. make sense and uh, get you further down the road in the sales process than you were when you first yeah, Who was it in one of our uh, mastermind meetings that we go to with somebody or another that uh, you sell seven seconds at a time? Yep. You sell the first mm -hmm. seven seconds, and then you sell the next seven seconds, and by the third seven seconds, you're definitely into content, if not the... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So if they're not reading um, or listening or watching a video, you're, you know, uh, the website becomes completely shallow and pointless, right? Mm -hmm. It's. Uh, I know some of our uh, potential clients need should listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> not mention any names. But, uh... <clears throat> yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> as you know, they they think they've got it nailed on on their website, but it looks not good. How about that for being mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and it doesn't grab you and say, I want to see what else is here. Right. And without that, mm -hmm. it's just nothing. Right. And I know, you know, we probably disagree with some marketing folks here, you know, who put a lot more emphasis on design, but I really think the design is just a frame for your content. You know, it's just a container. Mm -hmm. Uh, for great content and you know it has to be mm -hmm. nice but it really has to put the focus on on the content that's what people are there for that's the meat and potatoes mm -hmm. and sizzle doesn't sell uh, aviation as much as it does other things people are are smart and they need yeah aviation, so. yeah you go buy an airplane with you expect it to have power to take off <laughs> Yep, and not just a shiny paint job, right? Yep, with no engine. <laughs> yeah. You um, want an engine? Oh, that's extra. Yeah. <laughs> you want an engine, too? What's the matter uh, with you? Yeah. You laugh, but back in, say, the 60s and 70s, when manufacturers were selling trucks, you bought the frame and then you bought the engine and then you bought the cab and then you bought the wheels nothing came as a package wow who knew that's why i never bought a truck back then <laughs> i don't mean pickups i, I mean big, big trucks 
I, I can't think of anything more boring. I don't like the way they sell cars now. I just <laughs> give me the bottom line. Don't send me to 14 different people. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You, you should go into a Tesla dealer and see how they <laughs> and see how they don't sell you. <laughs> that's well, I should. I should. No, that's a, a, a really interesting experience. You know, we need to try doing a podcast episode without John using the word Tesla once. We need to see if we can actually make that happen. The last one worked. <laughs> so is that on his bucket list, getting a Tesla? <laughs> yeah, he's just a little bit obsessed. It's kind of cool. It's actually really cool. Um, they have a, a really nice uh, sales process and also a really nice uh, product, too. So, um, All right, so let's talk about your company salesperson in chief, in this case, Elon Musk, right? <laughs> nah, that's not my company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, some great salespeople in chief, um, you know, Richard Branson, Marissa Meyer, Ariana Huffington, you know, they're obviously kind of the, uh, they embody their brand, right? Mm -hmm. um, in aviation, we've got, you know, Brad Harris, Dallas Jet International, Renee Bangelsdorf um, of, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, uh, Jean Klo of uh, uh, GC. Uh, Aircraft. Aircraft, Great Circle Aircraft, and uh, Chris Kilgore of uh, CNL. Um, you know, he is willing and able, <laughs> all of those folks are willing and able to show up and represent their brand personally. And, you know, I mean, you look at that Annie video that uh, uh, Pat did with Chris Kilgore. <laughs> um, and, it, you know, he's really, really willing and able to be the the face behind the brand and do whatever it takes to to promote that brand and to promote their their values and and what they believe in and you know it's just so obvious that he cares so much about his customers and about his people and 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 about making sales you know mm -hmm. um it's a much harder thing you know when someone comes to us and says they want to market a product or service but they want to be behind the scenes uh, you know that's a little mm -hmm to do so Think, I really things have changed in the last 20 years and they need to keep up <laughs> exactly <laughs> but these folks are not people that necessarily create every bit of content themselves right oh no they have a lot of people helping them with writing and producing and polishing and you know all of those things because you know obviously they've got a lot of things to do as a ceo this goes back to and knowing knowing what content would work when um, I think that's an important factor in and they've got scouts for instance I, I have my news feed every single day and that tells me what you know tells me about trends and tells me about um, what is being covered now and uh, that's intelligence that I can exploit right and you know every one of these people has an editorial calendar you know uh, whether they call it that or not they know what they're going to be talking about at what time of year who did we mm -hmm. hear from mm -hmm. and i don't remember when it was but somebody said it may have been you that every company should be considered as a publishing company yeah that was actually three slides ago no 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 yep. it was way yep. before that Yep, it was. Uh, no, it was way before today. It was way before this week. It was like a year ago, two yep. years ago. That was the first time I read this book, um, probably ten years ago. <laughs> but uh, you want to think like a publisher, and every company should be a publishing company. That's absolutely true. And uh, mm -hmm. the, because anybody can produce a product, and if there are five companies producing that product, the one that is producing the best content to go with that product meaning, and that could be training, that could be the stories of, you know, happy customer stories. Or, when did it change? It didn't used to be that way. Oh, I think it's always No, that way. it didn't. Okay, no. Harley Davidson. No, no. Fantastic stories. No, no, no. Before Harley became successful. Okay. Go back to the 60s when everybody that could say the word car could try to sell one. Coca-Cola, fantastic publishing company. That's, mm -hmm. maybe, but look at the auto dealers they weren't ford um, yeah they weren't publishing anything they weren't trying to teach anybody anything they were trying to sell cars they created a whole city with an ideal utopian society for their workers yeah and they were publishing yeah. well not only that is they created an image that everybody wanted 
Yep. A part of. Yep. But so they went public. Why do you want that Mustang? But I want to be uh, like the guys on 77 Sunset Strip. Yep. Talk about dating yourself. And they, <laughs> they invited reporters into the factories for that was they were one of the few first people that did that. Sunset Strip was a Corvette. Ah, heaven forbid. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, no, but they they invited reporters into the factories. They were one of the first companies that ever did that and uh, wanted everybody to know this is an ideal way of of making things work. Yeah, maybe, but that was only newspapers. Mm-hmm. That was what there was at the time. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right. So let's talk about. Well, here's an example that's, okay. that's related to aviation. Yeah. Um, Pan Am uh, always, you know, every, all the aviation, all the airline companies used to just go to the major media markets and invite those reporters. Yep. And my father was director of North Atlantic PR at that time, and he decided that he he it was a particularly bad winter, and so he decided that he would invite like the Detroit Free Press and the Minneapolis Star Tribune and all of these second tier markets, um, not the New Yorks and Miamis and those guys, and he invited them to go look for spring. So he got them into New York, and he got them on an airplane, and he took them to Bermuda Gate, got a lunch, and uh, or was it was it Bahamas? I can't remember what. He went to lunch. They went to lunch, and then they came back. The ink he got from that. Oh, is, spring is coming. I can imagine. And yeah, so that is that to me. That was brilliant. He wasn't talking about Pan Am. He was saying, let's look for for a spring. Yeah. But don't you know all of the articles had Pan Am all over it? Of course they did. Absolutely. That was really smart. Yeah. You have good genes. <laughs> yes, I know I do. <laughs> <laughs> that is cool. All right. So let's talk about um, you know closing the sale and continuing the conversation. Uh, this is actually a really excellent point that I think he makes in the book. And uh, we did a little... Um, uh, follow up, you know, you make a purchase or if someone makes a purchase and then what happens? Uh, in a lot of cases, nothing happens. And that's the worst thing. Right. <laughs> you know, these are people who have invested money with your company. They are the most likely to invest again or, uh, you know, to support their decision by, you know, sending their friends and family and everybody else because they've already been convinced. And, you know, this is... Mm -hmm. Where the money in aviation is made is is what we call phase three sales referrals recaptures resells mm -hmm. testimonials mm -hmm. all that stuff mm -hmm. um and people say you know well we don't get that many referrals or recaptures or you know resells or testimonials and it's just like well what are you doing to get them they don't happen automatically just because you made a sale and sold them a fantastic product right nope yeah Right. Well, this is where I think a lot of companies drop the ball is they've made the sale, but they, but there's no care and feeding of their customer. Right. You know, retention retention is always a lot cheaper than than prospecting for sales. Uh huh. So um, they don't they don't uh, they don't do the care and feeding that they need to do uh, to keep to keep their customers happy and to keep their customers referring their friends and relations back to them so uh, i think that that sales are one thing but uh continuing building a relationship again all about relationships is probably the easiest and um thing to do and often the most ignored exactly we spend a lot of time you know with customers who are you know, it's really easy to get them to spend money on advertising, you know, for new customers. And it's really hard to pry their their fingers off their wallet to spend anything on their existing customers. And, you know, that to me is completely backwards of the way things should mm -hmm. be the folks who should be investing in. Mm -hmm. It's like a sure bet. Because it also says to the customer, well, I'm just taking you for granted. Oh yeah. I don't need to do anything. I've got my, I've got my, your money. I don't need to do anything else. And, uh, um, and that's not a good way to, uh, care for your customer. 
Right. That is absolutely right. And um, yeah, so, you know, one of the strategies that we recommend, in fact, John, when you uh, brought home the 172, uh, tell us about that process. Well, you flew back with me. I did, but I wasn't in the whole, um, I wasn't in every meeting, so. Well, when we, we actually traveled to the factory to pick it up. And before they'd even let me into the thing, I had to sit through three days of ground school in a glass cockpit. Mm -hmm. And then uh, my checkout was a little longer than most because I'm, I'm commercial instrument rated and I wanted to go ahead and fly all the approaches and become current again. So we flew approaches all over Oklahoma. <clears throat> and then uh, once I did that, then I went up with a guy for a VFR checkout. He had this clipboard with all the stuff that he had to check in it. And uh, while he's going through that, he said, just do whatever you want. I said, uh, okay. <laughs> so, Play with it. Yeah, absolutely. So I said, I'm going to do some slow flight here to see how slow it will fly. And he said, it's okay. And I got it, you know, full flaps, almost just barely above an idle. And the airspeed indicator, I finally got it down to where it was it's vertical tape. So it was bouncing between 25 and about 35. And the book said, huh. don't fly any slower than 49. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then I did some, you know, steep turns about a point, And he was just over there scribbling around, doing all the stuff he was doing. And, you know, turns about a point and a couple of chandelles just for fun. And just, mm -hmm. yeah. But the thing, and that was in, eh, what year was that? 2007? Yeah, eight. 2008, right. 2008, they had redesigned the leading edge of the wing, and its slow flight characteristics improved substantially. And uh, mm. it was really a lot of fun. Yeah, and then they sent you home with, well, we picked it up at the factory and, and flew it home. Yeah. Uh, and you got, you know, a card with a number that you can call any time, you know. And Oh, yeah, I got the uh, chief flight instructor for Cessna there at that factory, and I got all these other people that said, call me if there's any question about this, that, or the other thing, and or anything else you can think up. Right, and, and a big we, pile of books and flashlights and keychains and oh, yeah, all <laughs> kinds, and... All kinds of stuff. <laughs> right, and they still call you every once in a while, don't they? Uh, mm -hmm. Not since we got rid of them. Yeah, that's true. Good point. But, <laughs> but still, um, yeah, they had an excellent new customer package um, education, uh, you know, the whole nine yards. They sent us home with, you know, baby pictures of the airplane going through the factory, you know, <laughs> all kinds of crazy stuff. So I love that. I love that. Yeah, well, that's the way it is. That's the way it should be. It's, it's an appreciation of the business, but it also says we care about you. Right. As long as you own one of our products. Right. And I know um, Casey, you know, talks about, uh, I think Honda, Honda Jet does a very similar and probably even more elaborate uh, new customer welcome uh, process. And, uh, you know, I think everybody in aviation should learn something from that and, you know, maybe not to that scale, but, you know, you can learn something from the process. And whether you spend 20 mm -hmm. bucks on it or, you know, 200,000 bucks on, on your new customer welcome process. Um, you know, it should be in, in line with the um, price of the product, but everybody needs to do something, right? Em Embraer does, the uh, Embraer executive just does something similar at each stage of the game. Um, uh, you know, ever you know, like progress payments or whatever, they have devised these really beautiful gifts um, that, you know, our, our handmade boxes, gorgeous wood, and they'll put in the interior for the, you know, what the covering for the chairs or the, the side panel or, or little, little reminders of what has been ordered for their aircraft. And uh, that's all well and good. But if, if they don't want those little reminders, they can use that gorgeous box with the Ember Air logo on it. Um, for any number of things, because it is a work of art. That's fantastic. That sounds like a really nice, uh, I'll have to look and see if we can find a, a picture of one of those on the, the internet. I'm sure there is one somewhere that we can grab so people can see what we're talking about. 
Um, and then mm -hmm. you had some really interesting comments about news releases. I can't believe I didn't bookmark this for the group, but uh, yeah, tell us what you. Well, it goes back to to, to something that that um, I think that that normal public relations. Everybody thinks of that that as a press release is designed for the media. Right. And the media will take it and they will massage it and they will print a story or they'll just ignore it. Right. Um, my feeling is that with the internet, we are able to to get rid of the media filters for bad or for good, um, and market directly to con to our consumers, whoever they might be. So that not only is your press release designed for the media who may or may not write an article about it, you need to send it out to customers or whatever just as one, a touch point, but two, maybe it, maybe you're sending it out on a Twitter or a Facebook or, or a LinkedIn or an Instagram or whatever social media um, it is, just at the right time, it goes back to the beginning of the book, just at the right time that, that uh, somebody is looking for your product. Um, so it's the right time and the right place and they're much more receptive. But one of the things in the book that I was very interested in, and, and we were talking before we began, was um, the, 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 what, what, this, what um, Scott does is he talks, you put it on as a blog and, and puts the blogs into a book, but he also takes um, the reactions to his blog and includes that in, so you can see a little bit of the debate that goes on. And, when he first published it, he got a um, uh, guy from the uh, Public Relations Society of America that says, um, uh, direct consumer press releases suck. He used it for his own, own blog, and that was the title of his blog. And then uh, Scott goes on to say, this is the World Wide Web. We, we don't need media filters to gain attention. Right. Um, and it's a scattershot method to um, send out a press release that may or may not be picked up in, in the vast majority of cases that won't be picked up. Right. So, uh, so you really have to have a broader audience than just the media. So, and and anybody, anybody who's in public relations will know that, okay, the PR person has a, a, a very small world of contacts that he knows will print his stuff. And uh, so it may be a dozen reporters. And it was funny when, when Scott actually said, maybe a half dozen to a dozen reporters, I said, that's exactly right. Everybody thinks it's gonna be picked up in Podunk, New Jersey, and it's not. And uh, so um, he has a, a long, it's on page 339, he has a long section here on how to place your news re uh, releases beyond PR Newswire or Business Wire or whatever. Um, and um, uh, the other thing that, that I think everybody should know about is there's a website that we all should be listed on called Help a Reporter Out. And I trouble that all the time, both as a reporter and as a public relations person. So a reporter list there, I'm going to, um, I'm doing a story on traveling with kids this summer. What can you, um, what advice would you give me? And the, the, the um, smart PR person or marketing person will be trolling, you know, and, and it's delivered to your inbox so you can see it twice or three times a day, what reporters are, are working on, and then you can immediately respond and most of the reporters on there really like the fact that they're getting responses from people who, who may not, um, who just says, you know, I can give you lots of tips about buying an aircraft. Um, and here's my biggest pet peeve. I, I used it for a story I was doing for Insight and Sea Power, and I got a, a, some great quotes that will help the manufacturers of in -seat power units better their product and better sell it to their customers. So mm -hmm. it's called Hero, help a reporter out. And I think anybody who's a really smart PR marketing person should be trolling 
that and finding their, you know, finding the reporters that are, are uh, reporting on their segment of the inter industry. Right. And what's interesting is we're kind of living at the intersection of the new and the old right now. So a lot of the old mm -hmm. things still work in aviation, you know, getting to know reporters, um, using the, the Harrow, you know, help a reporter out, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, using the wire services. You know, we get really good uh, pickups from that. So, you know, I wouldn't stop doing mm -hmm. that. But uh, then no. so many additional things that you can do now that you couldn't do even five years ago. Um, you know, because your right. audience right. just wasn't there. So I think that's so absolutely you want to send it out to your reporters, but yeah. you also want to um, send it to all your constituencies. Yes, that's absolutely true. Excellent point, Catherine. I'm glad you 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 caught that because that uh, is something that's definitely worth worth talking about. Mm -hmm. All right, so next month we have a much shorter book. <laughs> this one actually will fit into our usual packaging. Um, we're happy about that. Um, also, there's going to be a lot less reading. This is uh, half the size or maybe even a third the size of the book that we read this time. I know, in, um, what was it, in middle school or high school, I had some friends who would actually pick the books for their book reviews based on the thickness of the book, you know, and because uh, it was less work for them. Good, strategic. Exactly. Yep. Strategic. <laughs> yeah, this actually, um, some people are going to love this, some people are going to hate it, um, just because Dan Kennedy's style is pretty abrasive, but he definitely tells it like it is as far as, as sales goes. Um, and I think the mechanics of what he talks about are excellent, um, whether or not the style is your thing or not. So I think it's worth a read. If, mm. You can hold your nose if you need to, but uh, definitely worth it. Some people are going to really enjoy it. I know John really, really likes well, it. Well, and, and regardless of style, uh -huh. you can't knock his success. That's true. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So his mechanics are definitely sound. And um, this one is going to be in the mail this week. So look for that. And uh, I'm really looking forward to, to talking about it. That will be so much fun. So. <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, um, thank you for joining us. And, and Catherine, can you give us a, a little preview of what's up for you nowadays and what you're up to? Well, I'm doing, um, I'm doing a lot of stories. Uh, one, I went to a Caribbean aviation conference and I got to put all those, uh, in the hopper and I'm, I'm finishing up an article for women in aviation and I'm going to a very interesting con uh, um, conference in London on single-engine turboprop operations. Uh, so that's the segment of the market that's where the subscription airlines are or airlines who are very small and outside the hub and spoke and the code sharing and all that kind of stuff. It's kind of exciting. Uh, I think that's, to me, that's where I haven't seen that much um, activity in the marketplace since the beginning of the regional airline industry post deregulation. So I'm really excited about that. Fantastic. And tell people how they can get hold of you or how you prefer they get hold of you. Um, well, I, I'm communication strategies at uh, www.catherinebcready.com. Excellent. And uh, that's Catherine with a K and Creedy with a C. So um, that's correct. <laughs> all right. And uh, John, what are you up to these days? Helping people build companies. <laughs> yeah, we've got mm -hmm. clients of, of various sorts with different problems other than, than marketing. So Exactly. All right. We're business consultants as well. Exactly. And uh, mm -hmm. we're gearing up, I think, to help people with NBAA and the other trade shows that are coming up later in the year. Um, our current special, of course, if you're listening to this during August of 2017, I know people uh, sometimes listen to this after the fact, but uh, is uh, basically we will do a brochure for you um, if you subscribe to our social media service um, or our digital marketing service. Actually, it includes a lot more than social media. It's also uh, um, <clears throat> some things like uh, being able to track your uh, online visibility and other things like that in a, a much more efficient way using some of the cool, expensive software that's on the market these days, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. So go sell more stuff. America needs the business, right? Mm -hmm.
Yeah, that good old Zig Ziglar quote. Still a good one. All right. Well, thanks. Yep. And we'll see you next time. See you next time. Okay. okay. Ciao. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us for Aviation Marketing Hangar Flying, the best place to learn what really works in sales and marketing in the aviation industry. Remember to subscribe on iTunes and leave a rating.